for a better understanding of the world around you, for a greater knowledge of the world you live in. Wolf and Dessauer in downtown Fort Wayne and downtown Huntington brings the Screen News Digest, a chapter of living history, into your classroom. Canaveral, August 1962, the beginning, the beginning of a distant journey for Mariner 2, thrust into the heavens by a mighty Atlas Agena rocket. Its work done, the Atlas drops away, and Mariner 2 starts on its way to a celestial rendezvous with the planet Venus, 36 million miles away. 115 miles above the Earth, Mariner 2 parks in space for 15 minutes. Then the Agena rocket comes alive and the space vehicle is given a final push at 27,500 miles an hour. Thirty minutes after launch, Mariner 2 is on its own, an instrument-crammed messenger in space. As it tumbles through the heavens, it spreads its solar panels, the wings covered with sunshine batteries, which power the scientific equipment aboard. For 110 days, Mariner 2 speaks from space in a jumble of shrill sounds that are stored, translated, and studied as scientists probe the far frontiers of the cosmic unknown. Listen now to the actual sound of Mariner 2. The flypast of Venus, scheduled for mid-December 1962, can provide the first scientific close-up of the bright planet that has been called the Earth's twin. When and if the mission is accomplished, it will be the greatest distance from which meaningful scientific information has been radioed back to Earth, and it will mark the first successful planetary flight ever carried out by man. In the field of piloted space flight, America unveils the Dinosaur, a revolutionary one-man glider scheduled for launching in 1965. A series of boosters with a thrust of two and a half million pounds are required to put the 10-ton Dinosaur into a 100-mile high orbit. The final booster is jettisoned as the space glider circles the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. The pilot can change orbit and even head for the moon. On re-entry, the cockpit shield falls away and the astronaut, using his upturned wingtips as rudders, guides the glider to a perfect three-point landing. Most revolutionary, most advanced of all American spacecraft is the Apollo the vehicle that will attempt to put this country's first men on the moon. Almost nine million pounds of thrust will be needed to propel the mother ship and the lunar landing capsule, now changing position in mid-flight, on their quarter of a million mile journey. Three men will ride the mother ship, called the command capsule, and at a speed of 18,000 miles an hour, the distance between the Earth and the Moon can be covered in some 15 hours. On reaching the Moon, the spacecraft goes into a 100-mile-high orbit. Two men will make the landing, while the third astronaut remains in the command capsule. The trailblazing descent to the moon is made by a combination of manual control and automatic systems. The lunar capsule will be able to maneuver much like a helicopter. It will hover in a fixed position if necessary, 
and it will move left or right so that the crew can select the exact point of landing. Once landed, before any other action, the men will prepare all systems for takeoff. Once this has been done, the great adventure can begin. The lunar pioneers will be instructed by the third member in the mother ship and by information transmitted from Earth. Photographs and samples of the moon's surface will be obtained. And apparatus for the continued transmission of scientific data back to Earth will be left behind. The two men will fire the launching engine at a precisely determined instant to make certain capsule and mother ship meet in lunar orbit. If all goes well, the two vehicles will dock in space and the moon explorers will transfer back into the command capsule. The smaller capsule will probably be left in orbit around the moon to save weight on the return trip. Following a mid-course correction and just before entering the Earth's atmosphere, the astronaut's capsule with the three men inside will separate from the command spacecraft and swing into its re-entry attitude. As the capsule streaks through the atmosphere, its heat shield turns fiery red then white hot. At 50,000 feet, a small parachute helps break the descent. Then three giant parachutes open, and much like the Project Mercury recovery, gently lower the capsule back to Earth, probably on land rather than sea, ending the dream of the centuries come true, a journey to the moon. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. In October 1957, the world entered the space age. At that time, a multi-stage rocket took off from a launching site in Russia. As each rocket stage burned out, the next one fired. The last one launched the world's first artificial satellite called the Sputnik 1. The early satellites, both Russian and American, confirmed the work of scientists in many parts of the world. The first American satellite was called the Explorer 1. Its performance, and that of other satellites, was predicted by applying natural laws which scientists have learned through the years. What are some of these laws? Surely you've done this. As long as the ball goes fast enough, it's held out by its speed and pulls the string tight. The faster the ball whirls, the stronger the pull on the string. An Earth satellite is a free-moving body circling the Earth. It is held out by its speed and is held in by an imaginary string, the force of gravity. The closer to the Earth, the faster the satellite must go to overcome the increased pull of gravity. If you don't whirl the ball fast enough, eventually it drops. Let's look at this another way. Suppose there's a tremendously high mountain above the Earth's atmosphere where there's no friction with air. 
Suppose that on it there's a gun. A shot will soon be pulled to earth by gravity, even though its speed is not reduced by air friction. If we use more powder, the shot will travel farther before it's pulled to earth. But a charge that's just big enough will send the shot just fast enough so that the curve of its drop is exactly the same as the curve of the Earth. Since we've assumed that we're above air friction, speed isn't reduced. Therefore, the shot returns to the point where it was fired with the same speed it started with, and so continues to circle the Earth indefinitely as a satellite. If still more powder is added to the charge, the satellite goes so fast that it moves away from the Earth for a while, but then is pulled back and keeps repeating this path. This is an elliptical orbit instead of a circular orbit. If the gun isn't exactly horizontal, the same thing happens. Only a horizontal launch at a precise speed produces a circular orbit. Now, instead of a gun, let's use a rocket to launch our satellite. It's a very big rocket. Since there are no mountains high enough to reach above the Earth's atmosphere, the rocket itself must go that high in order to launch its satellite. Just how high is this? We've learned a great deal about the structure of the Earth's atmosphere. The first six to 10 miles, we call the troposphere, which means turbulent. This is the dense churning layer close to Earth. It thins out to become the stratosphere, a stratified region that extends about 50 miles up. Then we reach the ionosphere, an even thinner region, which extends some 150 miles up. Beyond this, single molecules and atoms thin out into outer space. Earth satellites can take various forms. The Explorer was encased in a rocket shell, which also included fuel for the final burst of speed. At its base, it was attached to other rockets, which would carry it to the necessary height. The Vanguard satellite was shaped like a ball spun out of metal. The first Vanguard satellite was not this big. The satellite shell is carefully fabricated to contain a complex assortment of devices for getting information and sending it back to Earth. This is part of the brain of the Vanguard satellite. Its many electronic circuits are powered by solar batteries. Solar batteries produce electricity from the action of sunlight. They operate the measuring devices and radio transmitters inside the satellite. The information which is broadcast back to Earth is recorded for further study. This is the brain of the Explorer satellite. Different types of measuring devices are sent up in various satellites, depending on the information scientists are trying to get at the time. Here is the Explorer satellite, carefully covered, being hoisted to the top of the Jupiter C rocket for installation. The first satellite launchings used multistage rockets, that is, a number of rockets fastened together, each one firing after the other has burned out, leaving the burned out rocket behind. This rocket uses liquid fuel in its large first stage and solid fuel for the other stages. To enable the fuel to burn at high altitudes, the first stage uses liquid oxygen, which is extremely cold. Takeoff of a rocket like this requires a careful checkout procedure taking many hours called a countdown. It is conducted from a nearby blockhouse.
The early stages of the rocket's flight are tracked by ground instruments. Since we can't take a motion picture camera along into outer space, let's observe an imaginary three-stage launching by using animated models. The fuel in the large first stage burns out after about two and a half minutes, sending the rocket very high. Then the first stage is left behind as the second stage takes over. In thinner atmosphere with less gravity, the second stage greatly increases the speed and height of the rocket. This stage often contains the guiding devices that put the rocket into the correct path for launching the satellite. Now the nose cone is released. It protected the satellite against the extreme heat of air friction. A motor makes the satellite spin to give it stability. With the rocket at the necessary height, the final stage fires briefly to produce the great speed needed for orbit. The satellite is then ejected, and if all has gone well, it goes into orbit with the rocket casing trailing it. How high must a satellite go to stay in orbit? At a minimum of 150 miles up, air friction will bring it down in several weeks. At 500 miles or more, it might well stay up for centuries. Our first satellites have shown that the orbits must be higher than we thought at first because of unexpected air density at high altitudes. How fast must a satellite go? This depends on its distance from the Earth. The Moon, our only natural satellite, is about a quarter million miles away and travels at the comparatively slow speed of about 2,200 miles an hour. Closer to the Earth, where the gravity pull is greater, a satellite must go faster. At about 25,000 miles out, a speed of 7,500 miles an hour is needed. This satellite will circle the Earth once every day. At 1,100 miles out, a satellite must go about 16,000 miles an hour to stay in orbit. It will circle the Earth about every two hours. So there are many convenient orbits we can try to reach when sending up a satellite. Here is some of the information about outer space that the first satellites radioed back to Earth. Danger from meteor impact, very slight. Density of air at high altitudes, greater than expected. Temperatures extremely hot and cold on the outer surfaces of the satellite, but inside, 50 to 80 degrees, a comfortable range for man. Danger from radiation in space, much greater than expected. This is the kind of information which was monitored from the first satellite's radio signals. Do satellites have practical uses? One suggestion is that several of them, equipped with television cameras, can report continuously on worldwide weather conditions. They can also be used to rebroadcast television to the whole world at once. But this is only the beginning. Men have been dropped out of high-flying bombers and rocket aircraft to probe extremely high altitudes and high speeds. In a new field of research called space medicine, men are being tested for the hardships of rocket acceleration and other difficulties they may encounter in space travel. We have designed spacesuits to keep up the pressure on the body to withstand extreme temperatures, to feed in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. We are testing men under many conditions that they may eventually have to face in space travel.
Already, many plans are being advanced for the coming age of man in space. One plan calls for prefabricated parts to be shot into orbit, to be assembled there into a giant space platform. It will include a great hollow wheel about 250 feet across, pressurized inside with living quarters and working space. This wheel will spin around three times a minute. The force of this motion will furnish a kind of substitute gravity for the people inside. There will be storage tanks for food, water, and other materials. Power may come from solar mirrors focused onto boilers. Indeed, it may be possible to focus solar mirrors onto parts of the Earth to influence weather conditions there. Here in outer space is a natural vacuum for scientific experiments, bigger and better than any man has been able to create on Earth. Here, beyond the interference of the Earth's atmosphere, is an ideal observatory that astronomers have long hoped for. In outer space, we can build a spaceship entirely different from any known on Earth, since this ship will not have to contend with the Earth's thick atmosphere and strong gravity. With this kind of ship, we may be able to explore far into our solar system. These are some of the plans being advanced for the coming space age. Fantastic? Who can say? Wouldn't our present uses of electricity have seemed fantastic when electricity was first discovered? We have entered the space age. Where we go from here, only man's imagination and ingenuity will tell. You're watching Sleepcore. Media for Insomnia. things in the history of the world that were once thought to be impossible. As our Earth speeds around the sun at over 60,000 miles per hour, we are coming to realize more and more that many of the obstacles and problems that daily confront us are, in reality, merely opportunities. Opportunities to break free of our fears and ancient taboos. And we are discovering, too, that the very process of freeing ourselves forces us to learn more and more about ourselves and the world in which we live. For an awful long time, 2,000 years, people assumed that there was a schism between the mind and the body. There was the intellect and there was emotion. But only until recently, it, do we realize just how much of the time we actually influence the ongoing physiological activity in our own bodies by what we think about? Well, every, every stimulus, every stimuli in your environment that impinges on an organism is reflected to some extent physiologically. At the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, a number of scientists are deeply involved with programs that foster the development of the mind. As a psychophysiologist, I study the ways in which people adapt, adjust to stressful environments. And uh, working within the uh, space agency really affords a rather unique opportunity for a psychophysiologist to see 
people working at the, the limits of human capability. Um, okay. If it's possible to understand the ways in which people adapt to the unusual environment of zero gravity and sustained weightlessness, uh, sustained uh, long duration manned space flight, then it's possible to understand really how people adapt to unusual environments on the Earth. There are many lessons to be learned from nature and from the universe through which our world spins. Chief among these is the fact that the world is changing rapidly and at a rate faster than our most sophisticated technological inventions can perceive or record. As we humans strive to keep pace with these changes, the development of the human mind becomes increasingly crucial to our survival. What I began to study in graduate school was a psychosomatic health. If the mind can make you sick, the mind can make you well. And that's essentially the basis of the research that I and several hundreds of researchers now are working on within an area called behavioral medicine. Mm -hmm. What are we measuring here? Well, well, you know, we're measuring EKG here. Mm -hmm. But you remember that the major symptoms that you showed in the first and second test were heart rate changes, and you showed uh, significant constriction of the blood vessels in your hand. Mm -hmm. So if you just remember those two exercises and keep your breathing paced, you should be okay on this test. Okay. But, you know, you just do the Dr. Thing. Patricia Cowens is a psychophysiologist whose specialty is behavioral medicine. She's one of a growing number of women working at the highest levels of responsibility in the scientific community of NASA. Her research will help to unravel some of the mysteries of survival in outer space. SCA pilot Fitzbolton has called out the proper separation altitude. Five, four, three, two, one. We do have separation. Chase planes are calling. Clear. The orbiter has now sobered and is now on its way to the final descent to the runway. It was in the early days of the space shuttle, when it was first testing its wings, that women and minorities began entering the professional ranks of NASA. Trudy Phillips was one of those women. Pilots in the orbiter are Joey Gull and Dick Trudy. The orbiter crew has pitched the nose of the orbiter down. They should be making their final descent any minute. The orbiter is coming in over the runway at Edwards. We should have touched down momentarily. The more you think about it, the more apparent it becomes that human intelligence will be of increasing importance in the future survival of the human race. On this spaceship called Earth, we are learning to respect that intelligence in whatever form or color it appears. When the first space shuttle was tested in the mid-1970s, the director of the space shuttle operations at Dryden was an ex-Air Force test pilot named Ike Gillam. Since that time, Gillam has been promoted to the position of director of Dryden Space Center in California. It was from him that the first female and minority group astronauts received their introduction to the Enterprise, NASA's first space shuttle. From wingtip to wingtip is baseline to baseline on a tennis court. People are standing about 700 degrees of temperature, and the highest temperature resistant portion that we have is the leading edge of the wing that's reinforced carbon carbon, and you'll notice when we get around front, the tip of the nose. In the 21st century, the ranks of our space travelers must be filled with people of not only high intelligence, but great stamina, because the challenges of outer space will be many. Each one of those challenges will represent a seed of opportunity for human growth.
achieve this growth, all prejudices, taboos, habits of human thought must be cast aside, for the safety and survival of a spacecraft depend on the excellence, both mental and physical, of all on board. the 21st century, there is much to learn about our world and ourselves. This learning occurs best in a climate of equal opportunity. In that sunny climate, human intelligence, trust, and total commitment can prosper. We become a winning team. For our purposes of testing equipment, and we no longer had a need for that, we gave that up about three years ago, but that is where the water immersion facility Will be built, will be. I would like to go into space for a couple of reasons. Uh, the space program meets my particular academic needs, gives me something that's intellectually challenging, also physically challenging, but much more important, I think, that man needs something to dream about. Uh, we've explored our world far fairly thoroughly. I realize that the ocean's remaining, but the that's three quarters of our world, but there's really just two frontiers left, the ocean and space, and I'd like to be part of that effort. I certainly feel that women are, are here to stay as part of the space program. Um, you know, this time all the women selected were selected as mission specialists. Uh, I certainly feel that in future selections with women training as pilots that there will be uh, women selected as pilots. Um, I think we're here to stay. You're watching Sleep Core. Sleep tight. You say you want a different kind of a vacation, sir? Well, why not visit beautiful planet Q and get away from it all? Could I get a tan there? You can't avoid it. Planet Q has three suns. Even when it's dark, it's sunny. It never rains on planet Q. Just an occasional sugar shower. <laughs> Sweetens your disposition. The natives are friendly, too. Both of us. That's Quisp, the crown prince of planet Q. And talk about food. All righty, I will. Planet Q is the home of Quip cereal, the sugar-sweet quasi energy cereal from outer space. And it's really a short trip, too. Yes, if you come by rocket, only 47 years. But if you can't plan ahead, just fill up a bowl with vitamin-charged Quip. Take a spoonful and blast off. Well, what do you think, Mr. Quake? I think I'll go to Mammoth Caves instead. Quaker presents The Adventures of Quake, the earthquake power cereal from the center of the Earth, versus Quip, the crazy energy cereal from outer space. Time to go, Quick. Why the umbrella, Kuanche? It's raining outside. That's not rain, Kuanche. Those are meteor mites. They're mean. They're wrecking our spacecraft. I'll have to run between them to save it. Impossible. Nothing's impossible with sugary sweet Kuwait. It's vitamin charged for Kuwait the energy. You did it. Hop in, Kuanchi. Next stop, Earth. While waiting for Quist to arrive, try Quake. It's too late. I'm here. That was quick. Correction. That was Kuwait. Hi there, my name is Quisp and I... Whoops! Hey, what's the big idea? Who are you? Dr. Grab Grub, the greatest bug collector in the universe. Now hush while I get you into the bug bottle. What bug? I'm Quisp, the crown prince of Planet Q. To me, you're just another bug. Goodbye, bug. Oh, look here, Doc. This is me on the outside of this package. What's on the inside? My very own cereal, Quisp. 
from Planet Q. It's golden flying saucers. Yep, they're sweet and crunchy, too. And charged with crazy energy. What's crazy energy? This is crazy energy. <laughs> there, how do you like that, Doc? Delicious. Crisp cereal is fit for a king. Right. So how come you're only a prince? I don't like to seem pushy. Wake is better. Don't bug me. Get Quisp, the Quasi Energy Cereal, from Quaker. I think it's a natural question is, uh, why explore space? And some people have, uh, different people have different views on this. Personally, to my way of thinking, uh, part of human nature is to reach out and explore. The fact of the matter is, if man stops really stretching himself and extending himself and looking, looking out, then I think that's when civilization will begin to decline. Uh, man just has that inquisitive nature, and it's got to be satisfied. Uh, we're uh, right on the threshold of uh, really a brand new opportunity uh, to explore the uh, solar system and the universe and to increase the value of benefits back here on home. Our space lab itself, as it uh, is presently conceived, will provide us with a, a capability which grows on Skylab, expands on Skylab, and provides us with an enormous capability to conduct research in space. And of course, space exploration provides this, uh, this spiritual quality. It allows you to, uh, to f go to the unknown and find what's there, and uh, hopefully by doing so, you're going to improve your lot. To have a guy there to change film, to change programs, to repoint the thing, to fix it when it breaks, to take it out and put a new one in, uh, is in many cases not only uh, the, the rewarding thing to do, but it's the cheap thing to do. First, uh, we've explored the moon, and we've now gone to explore near space, and finally, uh, we're going to explore the solar system. All of this, uh, man plays an integral part. If our children and our children's children are going to enjoy the same quality of life here on Earth as we have enjoyed in the past, we're going to have to learn how to find new resources and how to manage the ones that we have more efficiently and more effectively. Of course, Apollo went on to uh, take us to the moon, but it also left us with a tremendous technology to look towards the future. And as far as Skylab is concerned, it represents a definite turning point.